Welcome to Hill Talk Tuesdays with Lisa, where transformation begins as we evoke, embrace, and evolve. Welcome to High Technology. <laughs> greetings, 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 and welcome to Heal Talk Tuesday. Actually, today is Real Talk, and today's today I have a guest. My guest is Jeffrey Wolf, and allow me to give you a small um, a bio about Jeffrey. Uh, we actually Jeffrey and I met over a year ago through. Uh, the Napoleon here, Think and Grow Rich. Uh, we met at some events, and since then, we have been in touch. And yesterday, I was thinking of putting this event, uh, this talk together, and I called, and I said, left a message, Jeffrey, would you be willing to be my guest? And of course, he said yes, and thank you so much. Jeffrey Wolf has worked with technologies as mature as milling raw lumber to as advanced uh, as virtual reality. He has incorporated new technologies into companies with teams of 14 up to $65,000, increasing profit while making jobs safer and hopefully more enjoyable. With radical changes forced on businesses by the great lockdown and now the explosion of the new EI that is happening, Jeffrey has been bringing entrepreneurs and best practices for thriving with their competition stumbles. Uh, what I know of uh, Jeffrey as background, his credentials are industrial engineering, product development, and he's worked on Hughes uh, Company. And you know what? As a founder of Advanced C Adventure CEO, author of Perform or Perish, and producer of Wolf's Watch live stream series and podcasting that you do. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's an honor to be on your show. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate <laughs> the work that you do. You know, it's always it's always fascinating and, an, and a true joy to talk with other leaders who are affecting and enabling leaders to accelerate their journey. And you're doing a lot of great work with that. So I do appreciate the opportunity to talk and, and especially to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we met, it was over a year ago at Rami's house and uh, mm -hmm. we got to learn uh, about leadership and actually even Rami's story of his downfalls um, and being in the street and now coming back and actually he's done this twice. I mean, going down, becoming mm -hmm. homeless, living in the streets and coming back to hit billions of dollars and overcoming so many obstacles and challenges. So as a leader, what does it take for someone to go all the way down and then up? In my work, we call it mindset reset from the core. Let's mm. talk about that. I, I love that mindset reset from the core because that touches on one of the huge issues with leadership what's in our core because that will affect our ability to lead nothing's ever perfect the military says every plan fails at the first point of contact with the enemy once you put a plan in motion you have to start to adapt because reality says eh, we're not exactly going to let things work that way and the, the the mindset you know how am i adaptable what you know what are my What's my perception of myself deep inside? The things that I only tell myself when I'm looking in the mirror, mm. when I'm shaving. You know, that's why I don't shave because I don't have to look myself in the mirror. <laughs> you didn't even but, comb your hair. You know, or, and comb my hair, right? It's like, so uh, I, I was doing a training for a group and we were doing a, an exercise. It was really kind of a, a just a, a deep dive of reflection. And I asked him, I said, you know, what is it that you tell tell yourself when you're looking at yourself in the mirror in the morning as you prepare for your day, go even deeper. Do you even look yourself in the eye mm. when you're preparing in the morning? And the room is just, it's just like, oh, you know, you just see it with, with the participants. And while they were, you know, they're, so they're doing an exercise, they broke out in small groups and doing an exercise around that. And I sat down in the front, I'm like going, 
Dang it. So I get my notebook that I take with me to, you know, to make notes about the, the events so they can make them better each time. Pull it out and go, okay, after, you know, my part of my after action is going to be, I need to start working on that because I'm throwing that question out to them. I'm going, hey, how am I doing on that? Mm. Didn't like the answer. So guess what? Back to, back to doing some more, work, you know, deep dive work on self which is paramount as leaders. And I've heard some, some people that are in, in leadership programs or, you know, business folks, professionals are going, why do we have to talk about this stuff? You know, this deep dive in the emotion stuff. And it's like, how free do you want to be? And how good of a leader do you want to be? Because that's the core of it. Under leadership, if people aren't doing the kind of work that, you know, that you take people through, that you take your, 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 clients through groups when you're doing group training through if they're if we're not doing that kind of work as leaders we are going to be at best less effective at worst really causing some damage because now i'm spreading mayhem as opposed to mastery interesting you know one of the things that it's happening around the world there is so much stress i mean we've mm -hmm. got stress globally what's happening um, mm -hmm. at least in Armenia, we've got stress hometown. We've got mass shooting every single day, even, uh, you know, the world nowadays, everybody's talking about Matthew Perry and yes. we're talking about how is it possible? How sad is that? And it, today, what I want to talk about is I actually, I even put it in my newsletters about the masks we wear. Mm. So many masks we wear and come Halloween, we dress up what we want to and pretend this is one day we give ourselves permission to be whatever we want. And yet the yeah. other days we constantly have to put masks on in order for us to fit in, to look good. I mean, Matthew Perry and so many, I mean, we were talking about Robin Williams, depression, comedy, and he masked everything for years with comedy. Three's a company. What was his name? The gentleman. John Ritter. John Ritter. John Ritter. And after he died, they said, well, he's been suffering with depression and loneliness. So I, it's, how do we stuff? And it doesn't matter if we are leaders or non-leaders, home, uh, at working at home or mm -hmm. just an employee. Doesn't have to be a celebrity. Well, and I think, you know, the, these these major tragedies that we see. You know, people that are that are loved globally because of the entertainment the, the that they've brought us. Those moments of relief that they've brought us to find out that, you know what, they were doing that in some of the darkest moments of their personal lives. And to see that writ large is a great reminder that, you know what, who in our family is in that situation? Who, who on my street, when I walk out and look up and down the street, who on my street is in that situation where, and, and they're not talking about it. Like, Oh, hi, how you doing? I'm fine. How you doing? Fine. Okay, great. Now let's move on. It's like, but we, it's we autumn go ahead it's shame you don't talk yeah. about it you don't share yeah. that right and i mean there was a, a point in my life where, where it's like i'm not going to tell you about my stuff that's bugging me i'm not going to tell you about the the horrible conversation i have myself with myself at 2 a.m because you know what if i can't handle my stuff you certainly can't and i'm not about to risk you doing something with it you're just, just going to use it to get one over on me anyway so i'm going to carry this and, and, and it keeps getting way. big. We carry it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I mean, geez, you can see it from a satellite without a camera in orbit for some folks. They're carrying such a, you know, a big train of garbage that's built up. I know I certainly did. And it's, it's scary. It's hard. You know, it's emotionally scary to address that. It's a lot easier to go. Ah, it's fine. I, you know, I'm just going to set that over there. And, you know, but, but, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it sometime but I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this over here. Oh, new shiny object. Actually, now that you brought it up, let's be frank. This is real talk with Lisa. Um, you have suffered through some addictions of yourself. 
on your of your own and now you have mm. been sober for quite a long time what no who me no 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 man it's been fine i'm fine i'm good let's let's move on no jokes aside yeah. you I've are now having five mentor. just having some fun with you because i know you know and i have been i've had i've been doing a lot of work for a long time and continue to you know strive to be a little bit better each day as a person so, so that i can have so that i can be more helpful to others so let's go back uh at what point in your life did you come to admit yeah i do have an issue when i met someone met a gal this is before i met my current you know i've been married for a long time this is way before uh, my wife and i met I, I met a gal and it was one of those moments where it was like oh my gosh i thought this just happened in the movies you know we we talked for a couple hours we met at a party we talked for a couple hours and it was just like we had known each other forever and i had and i just i was going home i had to go to work in, early in the morning uh to do some stuff on uh, work on the weekend and um uh, i was leaving and I just thought wow this this is amazing and my drinking and other things that i did got in the way of being able to follow up on the dinner that she agreed to have with me because I, I was like one of those things going there's no way this woman will ever have something to do with a guy like me and she's like yeah i'd love to go out for dinner i'm like oh crap now what and it was one it was that was one of it wasn't the only but that was a critical moment where i'm looking at going i can never have that in my life because i'm i've got this other problem that i'm refusing to deal with and to own and it's and it is a prison that I built for myself that was just misery. You know, I was trapped inside of my own misery with no with no way out and no hope and totally alone in the universe with it. And seeing the look in her eye go from go from yes to, you know, she liked me. We were gonna go out to dinner. And I watched that in the course of the evening at the party that we were at turn into disappointment to oh hell no i don't want anything to do with you and it was like okay so because you know, for a long, long time were you in this situation i mean how many years oh. what are we talking about after college what started it, actually share with us i i'm also curious um mm -hmm. even though i work with a lot of clients uh, through hypnosis, changing the mindset reset from mm -hmm. the core, which is truly the pattern. Um, where does the line get drawn? I have my own theory from social drinking or doing drugs or whatever to becoming addicted, that aspect of it. And how long did it go until you yeah. said no? I mean, for me, there was never a line. Uh, it was from the get go. I, you know, I remember the first drink that I ever had because it was just, I, I was an overweight bookworm, uh, sci fi fan kid that didn't have a lot of social skills. I guess we called a nerd today. And uh, my wife asked me, she goes, Why are you always in the middle of stuff? Why do you, because I do a lot of public speaking. She's like, Why do you do that? I go, Because I'm painfully shy and people scare me. So I'm going to stay in the middle of everything. If I don't, I regress to being a wallflower and edging towards the exit. Even yeah. today, I'll catch myself going, you know, stop standing off to the side, stick out your hand, go over and say hi, start talking. You know, it's like, geez, how do I start a conversation? It's like smile and go, hi, how you doing? My name is. So you standing here, you know, and sometimes it's just some of the lamest introductions that I've done have, have led to some incredible conversations. But as you know, as a kid, when I was very young, I remember the first drink that I had that had that effect that I loved. And it was like every cell in my body said, oh, yeah, we have come home. And I just was not, I felt comfortable. I wasn't worried about what everybody else was thinking. And it's like going, okay, this, this, is, this is good. And I wanted more of that. And 
And I, it was just from that point forward, oh, you know, overdoing it constantly. The line I did experience was after college, when I had moved cross country, was in a, you know, in a you know, reasonably high powered management position at the time. I was one of four managers that ran a $140 million production program. And uh, that I got to a point that I couldn't get through, I couldn't get past lunch without having a drink. Mm. And I hated it. And I hated myself for it. And I was just like, I could see where it was going. And it was like, uh, you know, there's just no hope, you know? And again, alone, it's, it's that state of no hope, totally alone in the universe. And, and having such a deep self loathing that it's truly incomprehensible. When, you know, it's, it's a, um, it's what we see, what we hear, what we learn. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a study of, uh, a twin, uh, that there was a study of many twins and this one twin, uh, the study was following them for over 15 years, uh, two boys. And uh, this is a case study. It's reality. It's one of the things that I talk to with my clients that as they were following them for years and years, every year they would go and uh, find them, talk to them. They knew where they were. So right after high school, one twin, the, uh, this guy dropped out of high school and started drinking and doing drugs and chose one way of living and the other one chose success and came to become one of the leading bankers and everything. And when they did the study after 15 years, when they went to do the last interview, one of the reporters just out of curiosity was new and turned around and said, so why is it that you, you did this with your life and do you talk to your brother? He says, I have nothing to do with my brother, even though we are twins. Because yes. of my parents, my father was an alcoholic. And because of what I saw in our house, I decided never, ever will I have a life like that. That's why I chose the higher one. And I've stayed clean. I am married, three children, and this is my success. So when they interviewed the other brother and he said, well, with a parent and a father of alcoholic, what do you expect? Hmm. So is our choices because of what we see, what we hear as a child, is that becomes our pattern? Was that your pattern for you to decide or was it only yours? I, it was only mine. And I say that from the perspective that I have today. And, and here's here's why. I had a great family. I grew up in a great family. I am so grateful for the family that I grew up in. My parents were encouraging. Um, they taught me skills, habits, perspectives, values, you know, work to instill a value system they were, uh, that, is, that serves me well today. Uh, they were children of the Great Depression. Mm. So they knew, you know, first it's first it's the great you know, two decades, right? Great Depression, then World War II. It's like, great. They went through a lot. So they understood struggle, but they also understood enjoy the journey. And they had that example. And, and alcohol was part of it, but it I didn't see a lot of the things that people that I've talked to and worked with that have, you know, that grew up in, in really just unthinkable family conditions because of drugs and alcohol. And, um, you know, in my teens, I started getting the wrong messages from what other adults were saying. And it wasn't necessarily the meaning. Like one of the things that always stuck with me as, as a 14 year old was enjoy it. These are the best years of your life. And I'm like, I'm 14. I'm in school, which I hate. I have absolutely no control over my life. I'm going through puberty, so I'm just completely whacked physiologically. It was growing fast, uh, so it was like my body hurt. I'm looking at this going, it's all downhill from this. 
what exactly is the point? Now, as an adult, I look back on that and go, you know, had I asked for a clarifying question or two on what they meant by that, it could have been, look, the whole thing in life is whatever, wherever you're at today, you just you get to decide whether this is the best day of your life or whether it's going to be a miserable experience. At the time, that wasn't the message that I took away from. So I so I that I started to compound those types of of um decisions to say i'm going to take the negative out of what this person's telling me and hold on to that real hard and stack it up with the other negative that i've taken from what other people have said you know the, the i didn't i didn't apply myself real hard in high school well not hard i wouldn't say that not consistently you could tell what classes i had for lunch by my grades the school didn't particularly care for that behavior and you know they were pretty clear it's like you're not, you're, you're never going to go anywhere. You're going to have limited options when you get out of school. And I used that as a bonfire to create some options as I, as I got out of school, but it was still, you know, I looked at it and go, okay. So then that's, you know, I took a message away from that, which was not you, you know, it's like all these opportunities are out here. It's great. That's wonderful. I can help other people, but it's never going to be for me. Okay. It, those types of things. So that, that compounded and, and, and helped me, you know, that was part of my, my journey farther and farther off through North, if you will, uh, until I really took ownership of that and going, well, it, it's up to me. Do I want, you know, is this what I want? If not, guess what? I can start making different choices. I can start accepting and rejecting different messages because I missed that for, a couple of decades, even though I had the, the, you know, good examples around me at all times to reinforce the exact opposite. Now, some, most seek help, find ways. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the North Star, which is a date or something, something, you know, in my field, we say, um, change happens when the pain is so excruciating and hard that we no longer want to feel this pain. This is it. I'm down. I'm at the bottom. I no longer want to feel this or the reward or like yours going on that date or having that relationship, wanting that life is so powerful that it surpasses everything else. And we turn around and say, okay, I'm done. I'm changing my life starting today. And I know just like in domestic violence, uh, domestic abuse and every, all kinds of challenges in life, there's relapses and coming back. And yet the the shining star of what we want is far greater than the pain we are in. And you have been mentoring through 12 step, correct? Yes. Okay. And I've seen, I know you've seen all gamuts from relapses to success stories. Someone wrote uh, something on my Facebook that, a lot of people think that just because they uh, they are now sober, it does not mean that they are re recovered. Um, or if they have recovered, they're not fully sober. And that's one of the issues that I talked to you about, 12 step, that when they get together, they say, I am, uh, hello, my name is, and I am an addict, instead of saying, here, this is who I am. I am now sober, celebrating the good. And, you know, I was reading on 12 steps. There's a lot of talk about the higher power, believing in the higher power and all that. So would you share a little bit about what the program is and what are, what are all other helps for our viewers, and anyone else that may either be, they're suffering it right now, or they have someone they know who is going through this. Yeah. And, and it's, 
let me let me back up a step. Yeah. The two years before I started taking action on getting my life back in order, I was increasingly aware of people around me who who had already done that and were living happy, you know, looking at it going, that looks like, you know, that they're, I, I want some of that. They've got a happy, joyous, and free lifestyle, as it's called, right? They're, they're having fun. They're enjoying life. They're not, you know, stealing from somebody to get money to go buy something that, because they need some, you know, an alcohol or some other type of fix. They're not doing a lot of the negative behavior that goes along with being, in, in, especially in, in late stage addictions. And I watched that and going, huh. You know, so it started to plant that seed to go, well, if, if they can, maybe I could. You know, maybe there really is an option for me that could work because I was very clearly headed to either, you know, either being institutionalized somehow or living on Skid Row. Neither looked really all that particularly, uh, you know, just was like, going, well, you know, I kind of accepted this is where it's going to end up. Accept it, you know, this is what, or death. I'm going, I'll take that. You know, I, I was so unhappy that I preferred dying to living to, to uh, continue to live the way that I felt. Wow. And accepted that as going, this is, I've got these three options, be institutionalized, live on Skid Row for the, however much longer I survive, which could be 20, 30, 40 years. That really scared me. I was going, if I'm going to be dead in a year or two, who cares? And it started dawning on me going, you know, if I pick the death option, it may not play out the way that I think it would. And it's certainly not going to be some cool, you know, some cool movie ending to my life. And those, those people, their examples caught my attention. And it finally got to the point of going, you know, maybe, maybe it's worth taking a small action. Which I did, you know, I just I just went and sat with a group of people that were on that path at the invitation of someone that I knew and respected. That's all I had to do. Just go just go sit, see what it's about. I was like, well, hmm, this isn't what I expected. So I went back again, you know, went and sat with another group the next day. It's a small action. Is it going, huh? I walked in the door and people smiled and said, hi, how you doing? Stuck out their hands, told me their name. Want a coffee and a donut? Kind of like that. No, I was in my 20s. So I was like, yeah, donut sounds good. And at that time, people weren't greeting me when I went places. You know, they were like, yeah, what do you want? Or we told you you're not welcome here anymore. Or my family's not returning my phone. You know, so there's this isolation that goes along with it. Jeffrey, did a lot of, were there family members that, uh, dissed you or did not want you uh, in their gatherings or something like that? In, in the extent of going, look, it, always with love. You're always welcome here. Doors always open. We're willing to have you around. Not if you're going to show up like that. Mm. Right. I, I, hmm. <laughs> so let's talk. You want the real stuff? It's like I showed up at my mother's funeral late loaded roaring in on my motorcycle long hair had david lee roth hair in those days of, like the singer for van halen from the 1980s and and, and uh started a fist fight with somebody at my mother's funeral that was me because what you know the guy deserved it i was mad because two of my friends tackled me and held me to the ground while someone else drug him out and drug the other guy out and threw him out the front door or hustled him out. He didn't really throw him, but you know, it escorted him out the front door. And I was upset because I felt that the gentleman had earned more, um, uh, more of a response for me and I didn't get to deliver it because he had, because he was so out of line. I mean, he showed up at my mother's funeral and he didn't really think he belonged there. And then he had the, then he had the audacity to reach out to to make a negative comment about my hair and reach out and grab my hair. And it's like, you don't do that. You know, just just he dis right. So this is an ironic moment. So, such a lack of self-awareness. He disrespected me 
So I started well, you know, I started throwing fists at him at my mother's funeral because he's showing disrespect. Because, you know, of course, it was all about me at that time. And um, that was the kind of behavior that I engaged in. But put a suit on, you know, put a nice suit on, go to a corporate event, sit in the boardroom, could do that too. Get out in the parking lot, pull a bottle out of the car, start drinking. And if you come out in the parking lot from the boardroom and say something to me, I just might smack you with a bottle. It's a little unpredictable in my behavior. And, uh, you know, some of my, and one of my excuses was, look, I, some of my friends were really brawlers. They loved the fight. And some of them weren't, you know, they weren't alcoholics or they just loved the fight. And they grew up in an environment where that was okay. And, you know, they get in a fight and sometimes never talk to each other again, you know, or sometimes they get in a fight and slap each other on the back and, hey, I'll buy you a beer kind of a thing. And and I never, I never got that, you know, so I'm like, going, look, I'm not like that. You know, I only, I only do what's appropriate and necessary in the moment. So it's just, a, you know, I had justification for all of that. And uh, it's like, it's wow, it's just unbelievable the lengths that we can go to as human beings to justify things that are truly unjustifiable. Mm. Which is recognizing that there is an issue that we need help is the first step towards that change. Because yeah. um, what I know is dependency is deeply connected with the subconscious cause and motivation. And it could be shyness. It could be masking self-awareness, mm -hmm. self-consciousness. It's, uh, it's, it, it can be just gamuts of everything and what feels good at the moment when you said it. So how do we go in helping understand now that we understand it it can come from any anything from robin williams taking comedy from it doesn't matter if it is a drug addiction alcohol addiction gambling addiction overeating it, it's in feeding especially most of those are oral mm -hmm. and i say express it versus suppress so it's all suppressing so much until mm -hmm. we get to a point that it's overwhelming it has to be it has to come out and it comes out as you said either in a fist fight or anger or retaliation or something like or, that or, or or folded up in the corner weeping wetting on myself mm -hmm. i never knew where my evening was going to end and when i was a teenager or even younger than that. But, you know, at that age, it's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's fun, right? I got no control over my life. So let's just let the dogs out, see where it goes. And if it's somewhere embarrassing, it's like, whoops, you know, but then when I'm 25, not so much. Not so much. And it, it really is it, in working, in helping people that are in that state, they're sick. Right. And there's different, there's a lot, there's just take the alphabet and there's something for every letter and probably go back through it again, where somebody has, has some type of, of some form of illness. It's like it, to treat them as sick, you know, be, have that kind of empathy for them yet maintain boundaries. Like, you know, like fortunately my family did for me, they never, they never broke the connection that we had, but they're like going, no, nope, not if you can't show up, coherent then please just stay wherever you're at kind of a thing so there's boundaries on that but boundaries still make it clear they're going not, not enabling the person or giving the money and yeah. okay yeah exactly so you know, and there's so many different ways to enable you know from the from the being feeling their feelings with them and getting into the emotion of it with them and in it's like that doesn't, it doesn't help, you know, until I got to a point that I was desperate enough to take accountability for myself, for my life, nobody could help me. Mm. So that, that was about boundaries. That was about, Hey, you know, it's, it's cool over there on that side of the room. Nice to see you. You know, if you want to be over here sitting with us, we're laughing, having a good time. Here's what you need to do. You know, if you're not doing that, that's okay. 
you know, we'll, we'll see you. We'll say hi, but we'll ask you to stay on that side of the room. But isn't that creating more isolation? It's like, okay, yeah. apparently, you know, I'm not good enough for you. So let me go and drink myself because I'm more miserable now. Yes. Some will do that. Some will go, well, what do I need to do to sit over there? It's like, well, if you come over and sit and just, just sit, don't say anything, you know, hang out. We love having you around. We're having a conversation. You're welcome. And there's a lot of power in that. There's a lot of power. I remember uh, someone who's, who's, um, who I've known for a long time now. One of the first conversations I had with him, or probably the first conversation I ever had with him, I remember was at a, at a uh, potluck at his house in the summertime. And they still do it for decades now they've been doing this. And I had a plate full. I remember I had a plate full of food. I'm standing with my back towards the wall in the yard. Got an eye on my motorcycle, can see everybody. And I'm like, you know, backing up a little bit farther, making sure I got the right angle to view. And I'm looking around and I'm shoveling food in my mouth as fast as I can. I'm just so uncomfortable because I didn't know anybody. And I knew somebody was just going to, you know, was going to say something to me. And, and he walked over and smiled and just looked at me, smiled and said, hey, just want to let you know, you're welcome here. If you want to relax, stay as long as you want. It's fine. You know, if you want to hurry up and finish eating and then go ahead and go, get, that's fine too. But he goes, this is my house. So if anybody says anything to you, come see me. You know, or tell them to come see me because as far as I'm concerned, you're always welcome here. Just want to let you know. And he walked away and I'm like standing there with my mouth hanging open. I'm like, how did he know? Well, we can, if we're really present and paying attention to the people around us, we can tell who's struggling or who's got something bubble, you know, where you watch their body language. You can tell, imagine with your clients, you can tell when, you know, they're like, oh no, everything. And it's like, eh, no, we need to talk about that a little bit more. There's something, you know, something's bubbling there. And he did that and he, you know, he, he moved on and I kind of, took a breath and I was like, going, okay. And I was there for several hours. That's the only thing I remember about being there that day was that he made it clear that, you know what, you can just hang out and that's fine. You don't have to talk to anybody. Years later, I heard a friend of mine say, you know what, she was going through a, a rough time, you know, a ugly divorce and some other stuff, you know, just things that happen in life. And she said, you know what, I really appreciate there's a group of us that got together uh, to hang out for, for a potluck once a week. And she, she was sitting there and she just said, I just want to tell you all, thank you because you let me come here and just sit and you don't ask questions. You don't offer advice. You let me just come here and sit. And that allows me to heal from the inside out. Mm. And everybody was practically weeping at that. You know, and we're just like going, yeah, because we we had all it's one of those things. She's going like going, yeah, I get it, I get okay, cool, and then we let it be. She said that, and she just kind of gave us a look. We're like, you know, we're all hey, you know, glad you're here. You know, can we get you get you some to drink or you know? She's like, no, nope, I'm good, okay. And and as she, you know, and she did work that she needed to get through what she was going through. And, and, and she came back to being more talkative and you watch, watch, watch the, the lights come back on again. Right. You know, there's so many things we, we focus a lot on, on the root, on some of the obvious, you know, the, the drug and alcohol addiction, severe mental illness, those types of things. But there's so much more that's way, way before we get to that point. Like you're asking, you know, where do we start? Where does this stuff start? Where do we cross those lines? We're going, you know, if we hadn't taken that step, and I had a million of them and they were all small steps. And the cool thing is I can always take a different step and change that path, that direction. But being able to watch people around us and truly be present so that we can ask a well-placed question, give them a little tough love back. And that doesn't mean being mean or sarcastic. I, lo I love sarcasm and dry wit, but it, it does mean saying, you know what? seems like there's a little bit more there. So I'm not totally buying what you're telling me, but okay. I just want you to know, I see, and I'm willing to sit and listen. You know, like that guy did with me while I'm shoveling food in my, in my mouth and his, I moved out to his front yard because I wanted to get closer to someplace I could get out of there after I got some food and, uh, you know, and, and saw what was going on. I just said, Hey, 
You're welcome to stay if you want. If you don't, it's cool. If you do, it's cool. Just hang out. Or that gal who had done phenomenal work, you know, the, the woman that she had become and then hit a rough patch in life because things were, you know, things were, you know, life implodes every once in a while. It's just part of, you know, businesses fail, marriages fail, children die, illnesses happen, cancer, other things happen. And it's like, how do people walk through that and how can we be there to help them on that journey? Which is why I appreciate what you do, because you're a major force in in spreading that, hey, spreading that positive impact. I have a friend of mine who got addicted to painkillers. Mm. And to him, it was the biggest surprise because he started drinking, but he never got addicted to the alcohol. And he drank only to numb the pain while he was popping the pills. And this is at a very young age because he got he was in a auto accident um i think he was about 19 years old or something like that and i remember through college and everything he struggled he was constantly struggled um you know i have to say he's one of the most successful people i know owning mm -hmm. his own company and everything today uh great family but you know, when we're talking about the old days, you and I are almost in the same age. We're talking about the hippie times. I usually say there was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of alcohol. There was a lot of everything, hardcore uh, music. But everything was about peace and love and flowers and making love. Nowadays, it's the music is there it's hardcore the rap the ver verbiage and everything even the stress on traffic and media every breaking news is nothing about murder and mayhem so we are surrounded with such darkness it's no longer flowers it's not about peace even though there was so much destruction in the country and outside but the people were about peace and love and everything. I mean, we talk about Woodstock and everybody talks about Woodstock remembers music and yes, making love and drugs. But nowadays it's the teenagers that are dying because of this suppressive and drugs and uh, lacing it with such potent medicine that our children are perishing. And how can we notice signs to help them? Well, I, I think the music that we listen to is a big indicator. For one thing, in you know, what media are we watching? What messages are we getting? What conversations are we having with, with the younger adults, with youth? Yes. Or not having? Because it, you know, I... I have become much more aware of the songs that I listen to. And there's a couple songs and I, I couldn't give you an example. Um, one of them is a line is I'm a loser. And I loved the song because of the sound of it. And I really sat and listened to the lyrics one day and I was going, I don't want to put that in my head. Right. Cause that's, that's feeding the neck. That's feeding the negative that's conversation that I'm going to have with myself at 3 AM that I don't want. And I go, why would I listen to that? And I paid more and more attention to <laughs> songs. It's one of the reasons I've never liked gangster rap. Because I listen to the lyrics and I'm going, look, if all of our kids are growing up listening to um, listening to lyrics in songs, idolizing artists that create songs that have lyrics about um, ab about running crime gangs in the street and all the behavior that goes on around that. How are we making sure that doesn't run off the rails for them? And I'm not, I'm not now let me full disclosure. I'm not saying rap music is killing our country and our children. I'm not saying that. That's it. What I'm saying is listen to the, what's the counterbalance, what gives it context to make sure they're going, yeah, you know what? This is, this is music. This is fantasy. 
I see, you know, I see kids from upper middle class neighborhoods paying hundreds of dollars to get ripped jeans that don't fit right. So they hang low around their waist so they can look like they're, you know, look like they've got street cred. And I'm like, A, you wouldn't last five minutes with people that actually have street cred. B, is that really what you want to emulate? Is that where you, you know, is that what you want? Life and, you know, violent life in the street. A lot of, you know, some of the people that have violent life in the street don't want that, but mm -hmm. it, it's back to do we, and I'm not saying that, that the clothing is going to lead there. I think it affects, we, we don't, when we lose the thread on where does this come from? And a friend of mine that had is turned his life around phenomenally. He did a fair amount of time in, in the prison system in California when he was younger. And he said, you know where that comes from? I said, so we're watching, you know, we're watching, I forget what it was. I made a comment about, you know, a couple of young, young adults that looked like their pants were going to fall off at any second in, uh, in a, a cracked a joke about it. And he goes, you know where that comes from? And I go, no. And he goes, that comes from the California prison system. I go, really? He goes, yeah. Because the way the prisons, you know, the, 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 the different gangs that run the prison system inside, he goes, one does the laundry and they're at odds with this other gang. So what they would always do is when they return the laundry to the other gang, they would always make it two sides, you know, many sizes too big so it always drooped around the waist wow so they flipped the script on that and turned that into a badge of honor to show when you're out walking in the street when your pants droop like that that's a badge of honor showing you've done hard time in the state prison system and you're a true gangster so beware wow that's now, now it's a cultural icon with our kids i'm like going Man, is that really the direction we want to go with it and it's like okay you know want to wear your pants that way that's fine that doesn't bother me, but do you really, you know, are you really thinking about what you're doing and what does that mean to you? So it's, I, I could go on with that. It's just, in, so in my personal life, and this is coaching that I've gotten from, from, uh, you know, business and, and, and personal development um, advisors that I've had coaches, you know, they're going, what, and that's something from Napoleon Hill, you know, what do you focus on? from think and grow rich mindset. Where do you focus? Napoleon Hill's work was based on, on the most successful businessmen of his time. In the common thread was what's their mindset. You know, the com the common thread in a street gang is the mindset. The common thread in a, you know, motorcycle club is the mindset. The common thread in a high performing business organization is the mindset. The, the common thread in the team that's going to win the Super Bowl, whoever they, I don't know who it would be, but in 2024, there's going to be a, an NFL Super Bowl game and the winner, the winning team will be the one that has the strongest mindset because they are competing. Those two teams are performing at such a high level. The only difference is what's going on between their ears. Mm. Everything else is pretty much the same, right? There's no better players in the world than the ones that are there to compete against each other. So it's all going to come down to mindset and what conversations going on between their ears uh, when they went. So where, where do you, you know, where do you want to be? If you want to be in the street, understand what that's about and get the mindset. Don't play at it. Don't be a poser. Go do it. I get a bit of a problem with posers. And you know, it's like, if you're going to go do that, fine, go do it. Don't have, have, <clears throat> excuse me. I gotta be careful. So I don't say something. I don't use a word that wouldn't be appropriate for a uh, uh, PG audience, but you know, don't have to do it. Go. Good luck. You know, well, their life expectancy is about two and a half, three years. You know, most yeah. of them don't live past past 17 or so. If you want to if you want to be in the NFL, look at that mindset. I had a chance to get to know Bo Eason, who became one of the top safeties in the NFL. He started wow. practicing every day at 5 a.m. when he was nine years old. I'm listening to this guy and I'm looking at him going. I am so embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't do anything since I consistently since I was nine years old, except maybe run bad, you know, bad self-talk. You're going, OK. But that was what that was why he became an NFL player. And he was a very unlikely candidate for being a top competitor in the in the NFL because he's not doesn't have that massive build like the NFL players do. So he, he found he's going, OK, here's what I'm going to have to do if I want to get into the NFL. And he did it. But imagine, well, imagine having one of your kids get up at 5 a.m. To, to, to practice guitar, to study math, 
to study a language to to you know hone hone some type of a skill exactly because the the ones that are you know there's something about the the outlaw culture in in, in the US they're getting up at 5 a.m. and practicing what they do every day too and the ones that that live for any length of time they're smart too and we we often underestimate them so to watch some people that come from that environment, you know, coming back to what we were talking about earlier, that for whatever reason, they got to that point in their life where that switch tripped. And they're like going, I'm done with this. And then to see what they, the, the people, the men and women that they become and the things that they achieve with their lives. Some of them, great public things. Some of them, A-list entertainers that we, that we know today that had horrible backgrounds before they, before they did what they did. And the reason that they were successful is they got, they got um, what was going on in here straightened out. And uh, the reward was far greater of what they wanted. The same thing goes with yeah. uh, Wayne Dyer, how he stopped drugs and alcohol yes. and his anger and everything. And he became one of the biggest like uh, mentors and speakers and he, he always said i've had so many failures in my life three wives and so many children but uh and i stopped drinking his anger for his father was so much that when he went to the grave all he could do is weep and say all these years of my anger instead of making peace with him and at that moment, I had to let it go. When I let go of my anger and resentment is the day that I stopped drinking and suppressing. So, yeah. you know, today, as you brought up Napoleon Hill and his principles, which is desire and faith and uh, the auto suggestion that we give ourselves in our mind, um, imagination, organization, um, persistence, um, decision and mastering our mind uh, and specializing in something. But the one that because of the work that I do, the subconscious mind, which is the power, the brain and our intuition comes to play in everything from richness to being a better human being. And that's all. That's what I tell my clients. Just become better. It does not have to be perfect because there is no perfection. Actually, you know, there is a saying that we are perfect with our imperfections. And to accept every single person. I, I used to be in Toastmasters. I'll share this with you and we're come to an hour already. This has been amazing, Jeff. Thank you so much. When I was in Toastmasters, um, I wanted so bad to speak properly and deliver everything so good to win the competition of the week or the day and everything. And one of the ladies, she was probably about 30 years, 40 years elder, she came and sat and sat down next to me and said, Lisa, you have a great vocabulary for words. And every week you challenge yourself and you look to be the best evaluator. May I suggest something? And I said, of course. And she said, stop policing. Oh. That means everybody can find fault and everybody makes mistakes. You don't have to be the police. And that stuck with me to become more compassionate and become kinder and accepting people for who they are, because I know I have my own faults. Yeah, I, I do too. It's yeah. what we do with them. You know, how do, how do we, it's the people we come become in spite of our faults and shortcomings. Yes. And then over time, those tend to improve or go away. You know, something my dad told me that, that literally saved my life when I was older. 
it was, uh, he goes, look, you're always in the middle. He goes, no matter what, he goes, pick anything you want to focus on, he says, whether it's money. He goes, if you, if you want to talk about money, he goes, there's always, he goes, no matter how much money you have, there's always going to be someone that's got more. Mm. There's always going to be someone that's got less. There's always going to be someone that's getting promoted more than you are. There's always going to be someone that's not getting the promotions at work. So there's going to be someone smarter, someone not as smart. He goes, you're always in the middle, no matter what. He goes, never forget that. And there's a lot of power in that of being in, you know, it's one of the reasons that I like to be in the middle. It's the good place to be because that means I can reach a hand across to my colleagues, my peers. They get to have the opportunity to call incredible people like, like yourself, friend, right? Can reach out and across. I can reach down for lack of a better word. You know, I can reach a hand out to somebody that's struggling more and say, hey, here, let me, you know, no matter, what, no matter what's going on in my day, I can always reach a hand out to somebody else who's having a worse day and go, hey, I see you here, grab my hand. And I can always reach a hand out to the person that's, you know, that's in front of me and doing better and going, hey, I, I help me get where you're at. Exactly. And people would most, not all, some, you know, and I've been one of those people that's going to smack the hand away. But um, most of the time, people will take the hand. You know, most of the time people will go, yeah. You know, let's, let's find a time we can sit down happy to share what I've learned on my journey. Well, on the journey of becoming better, healthier, happier, and joyful, um, I want to say thank you for being part of the Real Talk Tuesday today. And uh, if uh, this has been uh, interesting for you, by all means, uh, I hope you reach out either to Jeffrey, who can help you, mentor you, and uh, you can always reach out to me. By all means, I welcome thoughts, ideas, and uh, again, thank you so much for being here, Jeffrey, and shedding a light on not only your past, but how we can reach out across from both sides and say, I need help, or how can I help you? And with that, uh, I bid you all goodbye, and I'll see you soon. Hugs to you, Jeffrey, across this uh, platform. Until we see each other again, I will come down and meet you and your lovely wife that I have made that promise, if not at another mastermind sooner than that. And uh, until next week, God bless you all and may the universal light surround you always. Bye-bye. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from a week ago, two weeks ago, even a year ago, click right here.